let's let's do the book pitch first. Um, where can people get Making Navalny, your graphic? It's not a novel, because it's, unless this movie's well, a work of fiction. It's a graphic novel, John. Okay. It's pretty long. It's 120 pages. And what is it? Well, um, when I was making the film, uh, I was drawing. I always have a book like this with me. This is my sketchbook, and I always draw stuff. I draw everything always, all the time. And it's a project that I've been working on since I was about 14 years old. And when we were making the film, I was drawing everything all the time, except for when I was filming. I can't draw on film. And I took those books and the diary, diary entries and, and all the drawings, and I turned it into this, this little graphic novel. And we've printed about 500 copies. Um, and I've been able to give them to friends of the film, friends of mine, and, and supporters of the film, just as a sort of a memento for all of us who, who went through this journey together. Um, I want to ask this question first, and it's not meant to be glib. And that is that very few filmmakers ever want their films pirated. But let's just say your movie somehow got bootlegged into Russia and people were watching it. What would you say if that happened? Maybe it has happened, we don't know about it. What would this movie mean to Russian people? Um, well, that has happened. Uh, and Hooray, I, yes. I, I, have, I, have, I have to be very careful here because I have not encouraged people to uh, download the film. Um, you know, it's, it's clear that in Russia, a lot of young people especially are very good at using VPNs and finding the film, pirating it, sharing it with people, sharing it on Telegram and WhatsApp so people can watch it. Um, uh, and this is something that has happened broadly. Um, and I think it's terrific. I'm not allowed to say that, but that's really what the situation, because we need everyone in Russia to see it. It's very important. And for Navalny supporters in Russia especially, they see him again. It's like it's like he's gone. He he is his, he's not dead. He's in some sort of weird purgatory. But they get to see their guy again, and that means a lot to a lot of people. And and uh, and it's a wonderful gift that this film is able to provide for people in Russia. Um, I want to update with some news about Navalny himself. Uh, this latest news, and I'm not making this up. I read it on Radio Free Europe. I didn't know it was still going. But it is, and Radio Free Europe reported within the last couple of hours. Imprisoned Russian opposition politician Alexei Navalny has been placed in punitive solitary confinement for the fifth time since mid-August for what he says are politically motivated reasons. It comes one day after Navalny finished his previous 15-day term. Navalny says the decision was politically motivated because of his recent statements criticizing President Vladimir Putin's decision to launch a partial military mobilization for the war in Ukraine. So I guess Navalny was out of solitary confinement for hours, minutes, what happened? Well, Navalny has been in and out of solitary confinement for most of the last two months. We're talking about a room that's probably seven feet by 10 feet. Um, he can't sit down, he's kept in stress positions, he's being deprived of his basic human rights. And the regime does, does this to crush his spirit. Um, they want him to be quiet. But Navalny, for better or for worse, has no concern for his own self-preservation. His campaign to bring back down this regime and end this war is, is, has been fueled um, by the, the news that he is, is, is receiving every, uh, every couple weeks when he's able to receive news. And about a day ago, he appeared in court for the first time in a long time, which means we got to see him and he's skinny, and he's frail, and he had about three minutes to speak in front of uh, a microphone that was televised in a courtroom, and he used those three minutes to, to speak out against this mobilization that was called three days ago to condemn the actions of the regime, this brutal war, and so now he is back in solitary confinement, likely for another two weeks, and they'll keep him there for as long as they please. And uh, Maria, go ahead. Maria was describing his condition as, you know, the room, as Daniel was saying, is quite small. There's a folding bed that goes down from the, from the wall to the floor. It's lifted up at 6 a.m. every day. He's allowed one book every two weeks. And it, it speaks to, I think, the, his time, where there's one small window in the, in the room. I think it speaks to his insistence on being true to what he believes and his values, that he's willing to undergo this type of solitary confinement repeatedly in order to express his opinions and his, his, deep, um, his deep insistence that the war is wrong and that the world needs to recognize that and that all of Russia is not in support of the war. And he's also lost his attorney-client communication channels, right? 
Yeah, so, I mean, his constitutional right as a citizen of the Russian Federation is that he is allowed to confer with his lawyer once every few days, and this is the first time that a prisoner in Russian, in the history of the Russian Federation, so in the last, I guess, 30 years, that's been taken away. So, so Navalny no longer has access to the outside world. He's not able to receive information. He's not able to uh, give statements. Um, and this is particularly unsettling and very dangerous because this is a necessary step the regime would likely take before they tried to do something terrible. His lawyers also aren't able to actually see him. They've now created this transparent uh, cover over the gl uh, plastic uh, glass. So he, they, they, they don't really know what condition he's in. Daniel, I want to ask you about the idea of shooting the messenger. When I interviewed you a couple of months ago for KPCC, I introduced you as a filmmaker and in a joke that wasn't terribly funny, a CIA operative. And it was meant as a joke, not that it was any good, and you replied by saying this. I'm gonna quote you back to yourself. I have to stop you right there. You make that joke, but the Russians are going to find this tape and they're going to put this on state TV. I do not work for the CIA. I am not affiliated with any nation's intelligence organizations. I have to say that. And you weren't kidding. So is that part of how this movie, your work, obviously there's a much bigger story about how people are discredited. Is that something you have experienced and witnessed about how your work and this film have been discredited? Absolutely. Um, and I think you see it in the film. This is information warfare. This is a regime that contorts the world, that paints their own reality. And they have already gone to great lengths to... Uh, uh, discredit this film, to discredit the film team. They have, they have said that we are agents of the West, that this film was financed by the State Department, that I work for the CIA, which is why I'm sensitive to jokes like that. I'm Canadian as well. <laughs> and and in, in addition, um, they've, they've just been, this is just what they do. This is, this is sort of their MO. Um, but it is not even close to what Navalny's colleagues are facing. These are people whose family members are harassed, who have had to flee the country, who are in exile. And, and so whatever consequence there is for the filmmakers, it, it pales in comparison to, to what the, the heroes of this story continue to endure as this regime uh, wages this war in Europe. Well, and they're not even allowed to call it a war in Russia. Right, that's, the word is banned. Yes, it's banned. And it will get you 15 years in jail. Um, this is a question for the producers. There are a number of significant challenges to making this film. I'm going to focus on one with the producers, and that is access, not only to Navalny, but also to the places he travels. What were the biggest obstacles to both, and what were your workarounds as producers? I mean, Daniel can talk about access even probably better than we can in the sense that like, he and Odessa, one of our other producers, were on the ground in Europe. Um, Working on, we were all working on another project, and it wasn't going well, and it kind of fell apart. And through a series of events, um, in meeting Christo Grozev, um, at one point, Christo went to Daniel and said, well, you know, do you know who Nav Navalny is? And he was like, yeah, who's making that movie? And all of a sudden, Daniel, Odessa, and Christo were driving from Vienna to the Black Forest, Germany, to meet with Maria and Alexei and the family. Um, and kind of, you know, Daniel just sort of, pitched himself, you know, and, and Maria talks about it in the sense of like, sometimes when you know, you know, right? Like, and I think they just, you know, Alexei and Daniel um, had a great banter and a good connection and, um, and they were present and ready. And what, was, what was your pitch? I, well, I just have to speak to that. Maria, we did an event like this last night in New York and Maria did say that in regards to meeting me, when you know, you know. She did not know, she was very <laughs> difficult. Uh, I. I, I all of a sudden, people are responding positively to the film, and, and she's very enthusiastic about how everything went, but it was very, very challenging. When I met with Alexei for the first time, it was with Maria, and they have a very clear, like, good cop, bad cop thing. Alexei is, like, like very jovial and fun and likes to joke around and hear stories, and uh, Maria's kind of cold and icy and doesn't say much or, or smile, and she's just kind of scary. Um, and that has really described our relationship. But when I, I figured out their dynamic, I had to explain to Alexei the virtue of a documentary. Here's a guy who needs no help getting his message out into the world. He has this, a YouTube channel with millions and millions of subscribers and, and all this social media reach. And 
encouraged him to do was, was sort of project and think about this potential future where he goes back and he gets arrested and he's sitting in prison. He would need a vehicle, some, something that would keep his name in the global consciousness. And, and what I offered is that a documentary is on a time delay. It comes out not in a month, but a year. And if it's done right, people see it and they feel it and they remember it. Um, and this speaks to his media genius because he understood that. He understood the power and the value. And I think that's why we started filming. It was the day after. And but, I think, I think it what? also speaks to your earlier question too, just how pernicious and pervasive the Russian misinformation campaign is and the necessity to have Alexei's, Alexei's message, which is rooted in facts unlike Putin's amplified. But he is a media genius and that means he likes to control or knows how to control his own story. And he's yielding some of that control to you, which I suspect he does not give up easily and probably throws a, a couple of obstacles in your way. How do you deal with that? Because A, he has to give up control, and B, he has to be really honest and not try to hold anything back. Yeah, that was one of the greatest challenges and funnest parts of making this movie. When your subject is a media genius and he is a politician who knows how to manipulate a news cycle and a story, you then become part of his arsenal. We were weaponized very, very much, and we understood that. And this struggle of who's directing the movie is threaded into the movie. The film opens with, uh, I'm asking Alexei a question, a very clear question. And then instead of answering it, he's like, no, I'm not going to answer that question. This film's going to be a thriller, not some boring, in memori boring film in case I'm killed. Um, and I think that speaks to, the, to, to the, that tension of who is directing who. And it was very late in the process when we found a clip that, that's, that's in a shot that's towards the end of the film. It's sort of this hot mic moment where Alexei and Maria are talking about me as if I'm not there because I think the cameras aren't rolling. And it was very important to put that in the movie to, for me because it's like, oh, guess what? This is my movie. Thanks for letting us in. But this is very clearly our point of view and our film. The second thing I want to focus on is language. Daniel, I don't know how much of any Russian you speak. So there's a key scene. Now that we've seen the movie, we can talk about it. And I think you know what it involves, some phone calls. And even if you can't follow the conversation, are you reading the faces of who's in the room and at what point do you know that your movie has just taken an incredible turn and that even if you don't understand it, something remarkable is happening in real time in front of you? So there, there is a challenge when you're, because I was one of the shooters. We had two, cinema, two cameramen that, that morning, Nikki Waddle and myself. And when you're filming in a language you don't understand, you can sort of figure out a lot just by paying attention to body language and people's faces. Uh, there were a couple situations certainly where I thought I was filming something interesting and everyone was like ordering lunch or something. <laughs> that happens too. But the phone call was one of these like, I don't, I mean it's, I, I'm sort of at a loss for words to even describe what it was like. I had no expectations anything would happen. If you're a Russian spy, if you were- Neither did Christo. Neither did Christo. No, none of us did. I, Christo was like, it, it might be an interesting set piece for the movie, nothing will happen. I mean, we should probably shoot it because maybe something will happen. Was there a moment where you weren't going to shoot it? <laughs> no, because I shoot everything, but, but they were, I didn't, didn't have an expectation that it would lead to anything. And we were shooting for two and a half hours. We did five phone calls. Everyone was hanging up because that's what you do if someone you don't know calls you up and asks you some sketchy questions about a secret operation that officially doesn't exist. And then they called the scientist. And... I remember that I was like sitting back, I had the camera, I was on the off axis, and I was just trying to keep everything focused. And the phone call, I clocked immediately that the phone call was going longer than the previous ones. And Navalny was engaging with the guy differently. And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw Maria, who does not have like, her emotional range, as far as I knew it, was like mildly annoyed to very annoyed. <laughs> And I watch her jaw unhinge and hit the floor. And I was like, oh, fuck. I was like, OK, focus. Make sure there's enough battery in the camera. Keep it in focus and just keep shooting. And that's what we did. And, and that day was just extraordinary. And the way I think it feels to watch that scene was how it felt to be there in the room and shoot it.
And how quickly do you get the translation or how quickly do you know what has just happened? And that basically, well, okay, that's the first part of the question. Well, the first, the, the, the first challenge was that what do we do with this? This is revelatory. This is newsworthy. This is a Russian operative admitting this clandestine operation to murder Navalny to Navalny. It's, it's astounding. And immediately, Navalny's people were like, we have to put this on YouTube. And as a filmmaker, I was like, well, I don't know about that. But of course, I understood that the, that the number one prerogative was for the Russian people to understand with the clarity that this footage would provide what their government was doing. So we agreed to give them 20 minutes. They put a YouTube video together. Uh, 35 million people watched it. And I understood that this now becomes part of the film we're making. Like this information warfare, using the, the stuff we shot to take a shot at the regime and the regime's response to it becomes part of the story. Now, Konstantin is somebody who obviously tried to kill Navalny. But in broadcasting this footage, he, I'm not going to say you. His death warrant is signed. I mean, it's true, right? I mean, you say he's no longer around, and we can presume he's dead. Not that we have any sympathy for somebody who's trying to kill dissidents, but it's an interesting moment to contemplate, isn't it? Or not? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, here, he, this guy knew what he was doing. Uh, you know, he made his bed, and, and you know, now he has to lie in it, and it's more than likely six feet under the permafrost somewhere in Siberia, which is unfortunate. He had a family, uh, but also it's like he could have done any other job, but he chose to work for the FSB, and he chose to murder people because of their political differences and uh, uh, assist in these crimes. Uh, so I don't have a ton of sympathy for him, um, but we will never officially know what happened to him. When you are talking about making this movie, are you talking about a person or a movement that happens to have a charismatic person at the center of the movement? And even though he is obviously star material, how did you make sure that the movement itself wasn't eclipsed by his own personality? Well, it's a good question because his personality is very big. And there's certainly a cult of personality for the people who support him in a way. Um, but I think more than anything, Navalny and his political ethos and his, one of his, his cornerstone political beliefs is building a broad-based political coalition to fight this authoritarian regime, for better or for worse. Um, and he always comes back to that idea. And it, it's challenging. And it's complex, and I did not agree with him, but I understood his position. And I understood that what he was facing was very different from the political context we, we know. And I think it, his, his core political message speaks to that very right. question, which is you have to sort of enact what you hope to see. And he's always, he's constantly the refrain of don't be afraid. You can't be afraid of a regime because if you are afraid, then they will control you and you won't have an opportunity to express and to change anything. And in order to express that fully and, and truthfully, you have to do what you say. And so I think you can paint a picture, you can illustrate the man and his, and his life, and in doing so, you are actually saying, you are actually speaking to a, lot, a much larger message and a lot, much larger movement. I'm gonna get to a couple audience questions. I have two more questions for you. One is, right now, the children of many families in Russia are not coming home because they're dying in Ukraine. And there's obviously a story that a Russian missile, missile cruiser, cruiser sank while under tow and that it wasn't blown up by the Ukraine. Is there, in your mind, any chance of change that disinformation doesn't stick as much as it used to? We've seen people protesting in Moscow, obviously, or they're thrown in jail. But does disinformation last or are there cracks starting to appear? I think for the first time, the calculus has changed profoundly over the last 72 hours with this mobilization. This is not some far off conflict where they are sending uh, ethnic minorities from the, f from the farthest reaches of the country to go die in Ukraine. Kids in Moscow and St. Petersburg are being called up and their parents are pissed off about it. It's just a question of the political will of the people versus this oppressive regime. We have no idea what's going to happen. We could talk about a thousand different scenarios and the thousandth and first would come to play. But it's, a, it's optimistic at least that, that within Russia, the domestic instability 
um, is, is making Putin sweat, and I think that matters. And I think also Russia's role in the world political system is a role of destabilization, and it's not just to destabilize nations. There's an attempt to destabilize truth, and the truth is very, it's very easy to destabilize the truth and have a, have a sense of nothing is real, but when you are literally sending people to war, it's hard to maintain that kind of, that kind of ideology. And so I think that has changed over the course of these last even few days when the realness that is always in question has become hard to, hard to look away from. I think it's fair to say that Russia very much wanted Navalny to die from the poisoning, but Navalny says, you know, how can you be so stupid as to use Novichok? What, how does the math change that it didn't succeed, even if he might still become martyred by dying in prison? The, the original poison attempt? Yeah, I mean, have they, made, have they helped create even a greater enemy? Absolutely. I mean, Navalny's uh, international profile and celebrity around the globe increased tenfold after he was poisoned. It was a story that gripped the nation. Uh, the film is among many elements that continues to keep his story in the global consciousness, what matters, is, which is what matters. But there are a few factors at play. The regime was, was hoping that him being airlifted out of the country would be a compromise and that he would stay in exile like everyone else in the opposition. But he went back. And he did this phone call, which pissed them off, and he released this, this damning investigation, Putin's illicit wealth, the day he got back, which 100 million Russians watched in the course of one week. That pissed them off. And we made the movie. And we made this movie, which really pissed them off. Uh, final thing, and he sent a postcard to one of your collaborators, right? One of your partners in making this film? Yeah, I just learned this yesterday, but it made me really happy, so I'll share it with all of you. Uh, we were at an event in New York with Christo, and Christo showed me a postcard that Alexei had sent him from prison. He sent it in July, took a while to get to Christo, and on uh, the front of the postcard uh, was an old Soviet camera, um, and the model of the camera was called Moscow 4. <laughs> Someone had sent it to Navalny in prison, and Navalny wrote on the back, uh, this is for you, Christo, hope you're doing well, Alexei. Irony is not dead. We have time for a couple short questions, not speeches, so just questions. If you have something right here in the blue, go. Wait, there's a mic coming, sorry. So I was just wondering if you have been personally intimidated at any pro uh, before the film got published or not? I think, have I been? No, they're such morons, these guys. Like, I think they have bigger fish to fry. They don't give a shit about me. Christo, Maria, Alexei, staff and colleagues, I think these are the individuals who uh, are in danger. They put our faces on Russian television and called the CIA agents, which is just about par for the course. Um, but not, not really. I, I just saw a sequel to Brian Fogel's Icarus and uh, Russia is so intent on killing the whistleblower Gregor Ruchenkov that he, well, you'll have to watch the movie, but he's no longer public. Way back there, uh, just behind you, yeah, in the penultimate row. So there was a photo on the wall on the bottom right hand that was blurred out. What was the reason for that? CNN legals and standards. Um, that you know, many of the, the we had to go through a really rigorous legal process to like with proof of who were accusing and how they were being accused and Christo and his investigation and there were a couple of people that were maybe like that were we just didn't have quite enough to sort of leave it unblurred if that helps uh, one more question anybody on this side yep in the way back with the mask microphones coming Thank you. Um, you you said you're you're constantly filming, and this is a pretty short documentary in the scheme of things. So, like, what I don't know what got left on the cutting room floor. Like, what's something that we didn't see that that you wish you could have showed us? Oh, there are so many. But the scene that broke your broke your heart. Well, we all have we our all have our baby that got left on the cutting room floor. I'll what, share mine because yep, everybody gets their chance. The very best thing that we left out, which still breaks my heart. Uh, it's a piece of archival footage that Maria filmed. 
Alexei had just woken up from his coma in Berlin. He's taking a walk with Yulia through the park. He's talking about this OPCW report that had just come out. It's this really great shot where Maria's tracking them. They're walking towards the camera. They look like movie stars. And Alexei's going on and on about this OPCW report. It had just been released. And then something snags his attention. And he looks off and he goes, wow, look at that. And in one fluid motion, the camera whips around and coming towards us is a French bulldog on a skateboard. <laughs> and this dog is very fat and he banks, so he's not, the dog's not just going straight, he like banks a corner. This is like a good skateboarder dog. I mean, it was a great tracking shot. It was a, and, and the shot was perfect. So we're on the dog, we follow the dog, <laughs> we come back up to Alexei who goes, oh my God, that was way more interesting than the OPCW stuff. And I cannot tell you the amount of editorial jujitsu we did to try and get that in the movie. The dog or Navalny? The whole, the whole sequence. <laughs> oh, both. The whole sequence was extraordinary, but that's unfortunately something that, that got cut out. Diane, what, what did you hate to list? Um, there's a scene where Christo is walking um, in Vienna one day. And, and who comes up on a skateboard? Uh, nobody, but he's carrying a bunch of books and he's carrying a pizza, but he's carrying the pizza like it's a book. <laughs> And it's literally like flipped on its side like a book. And we cut and we see the pizza box roll, you know, on the table and he opens it. And of course, all the cheese and the pizza is like just slid. And I mean, it's genius. It's genius. Okay. And finally, Shane, the scene you hated to lose. I mean, these two are funny enough for, for the whole project. So mine is serious, the thing that, that I lost. But uh, it, was, it was Alexei's last speech before he went to prison in which he sort of fully communicates why, why it is he's doing what he's doing. And I can't remember exactly the line. Do you remember it, Tanya? Um, he, says, he says something like, don't hide your eyes. Don't look away. Everyone has to be strong. And, and we, we had to trade it for the last shot of the film when Alexei says, instead, the, the, the evil or, or authoritarian ism is only empowered when good people do nothing, don't be inactive. And that was a swap that we made so we could see him because we only had audio for the first clip. But the, the phrasing of it that really always stuck with me was don't look down, is what he said. Well, take that away with you, everybody here. And thank you for coming out. Daniel, Shane, Diane, thank you thank so much. Thank you so much.